Welcome to Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, where we bring evidence, experience, and perspective to make sense of today's leading health challenges. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. This is Stephanie Desmond. Today I talked to Andy Rifkin, Johns Hopkins astronomer who was involved in last year's NASA mission to change the orbit of an asteroid in space. We talk about what it's like to move from setting stars in the sky to a project that really someday could save humanity in the event of a planetary emergency. Let's listen. Andy Rifkin, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. So you are a planetary astronomer who was involved in that really cool project last year. I'm sure it's ongoing where you you moved the orbit of an asteroid. Tell us more about that. Yeah, absolutely. I'm the investigation lead for the Double Asteroid Redirection Test, or DART. It's a test of a planetary defense technique called the Kinetic Impactor, which basically is you take your spacecraft, you ram it into an asteroid you're worried about, and you change its orbit. In case of an actual emergency, you would change the orbit that an asteroid had around the sun so that the asteroid and the Earth don't get to be at the same place at the same time. For DART, what we did was change the orbit of an asteroid that's orbiting another asteroid. So it's a moon of an asteroid. So we didn't change the path around the sun. Uh, we just changed the path of the asteroid around its main body. And this was a success. Yes, absolutely. 100% success. All the engineering challenges were met. We came in. We'd never seen this asteroid or either of the two asteroids in the system up close. Craft came in at 14,000 miles an hour. It was able to pick up target. It was able to say, okay, that's the moon that we want. That's the big one we don't want to hit this small object. The asteroid we hit was only about the size of one of the pyramids of Egypt. And we have been measuring what we did ever since late September. And uh, yeah, we met our goals of how much we wanted to, to move the asteroid by, by quite a bit. So what comes next? I mean, I sit here and I think about sort of really how incredibly amazing it is that you were able to do this. And to me, it so comes from a public health background. To me, it feels like the ultimate in public health, right? Like you are literally could have an opportunity to save the planet. Talk to me about that and where you're going. The Earth has been hit by asteroids for billions of years, and those impacts have profoundly affected the history of life on Earth. And it was only within the past few decades, really, that we've realized that kind of the magnitude of things that, okay, there are still asteroids out there. They still are going to hit the Earth, potentially. Big ones, like the ones that, that killed the dinosaurs, not so often, you know, tens to hundreds of millions of years in between. But smaller ones do hit relatively often. Uh, we were hit by something about 20 meters across, less than 10 years ago in, in Siberia. It was realized that there's a size range that we could go out and deflect that would be useful, you know, not so small that we wouldn't worry about it, but but big enough that it would cause a problem for a city or a state or a, or a metro area if it hit. That's that's what DART is a demonstration of, that if we, if we found an object that was incoming that was going to be a problem to the D.C. area or, you know, the the Tokyo area or, or, you know, Lagos or whatever, we could do something about it. And yeah, so that's the other piece. And it's all part of one big strategy that we as a nation have, but also that we as a as a world have to find what's out there, because, you know, this kind of insurance policy is only good if you if you see something coming. So, so when you wanted to become an a, a astronomer, did you think this was something that <laughs> no, never, never. Uh, when I was, uh, I mean, the the, I've, I guess I've been in the field long enough that I've seen this change in attitudes toward planetary defense. It really was not a thing when I was a kid at all. We were only then learning, you know, or starting to think that the dinosaurs were were actually wiped out by the effects of an asteroid impact. And I remember, you know, being in in high school, being in college, having my friends, you know, they were going to be medical doctors, they were going to, you know, do all this stuff. And I thought, wow, I don't really want the responsibility of, you know, boy, what I really could ruin someone's day if you do, if you do something wrong. So no, the idea of, of saying we're going to go and do something with this big of a, a potential effect did, did not occur to me. <laughs> so what's the next step? You try to redirect bigger things? That's a great question. The um, 
in in terms of uh, uh, what the priorities of the community are, launching a telescope into space to do a, a really comprehensive search for asteroids that might come close, that might intersect the Earth's orbit, uh, is really important. There are other techniques. Probably we wouldn't necessarily smack something bigger with a bigger mass, although we could. There are other sorts of techniques that are less violent uh, that people want to look into that are more of, you know, you kind of slowly move an asteroid around either by vaporizing, putting a giant laser near it and just vaporizing the, the surface and having that act as a little rocket. People have looked into that. And then for the R object specifically, the asteroid we hit was called Dimorphos. The larger body was called Didymos. The Europeans are going to send a mission called Hera, and that's going to visit Didymos and Dimorphos in just a few years. And uh, they'll kind of be kind of the, the the bookend, you know, the second parenthesis, and be able to make some measurements that we couldn't make since we were just the, the one way one way trip. So uh, together with Hera, you know, we'll be able to to get a much much more comprehensive look at what the experiment actually did. I know that as you as sort of we've talked about the, the dinosaurs were hit by a pretty big um, asteroid, but other ones have caused other sort of some climate changing, right? Nothing as dramatic as as the dinosaurs. At what point would something like this be deployed, do you think? Like in your in the way you look at things, was it be something that's going to destroy humanity or is it something lesser than that? So the formal answer is that the United Nations has, you know, committees that have set thresholds and guidelines for okay, if if something is this big and it has this percentage of a chance to hit the earth in this many years, I don't remember the numbers off the top of my head, but they're they're out there, then humankind should look into trying to deflect things. In reality, I could imagine that certain countries might say, look, okay, so you don't want to launch something, but this is going to hit Omaha or it's going to hit, you know, Marseille. It's going to hit something. We We want to do something about it, even if you don't. So I think that a mission like DART is best um, kind of designed for some of these well, objects that are similar in size to Dimorphos, which is not a not a not an accident. So things that are 100 meters across, 150, 200 meters across, that are maybe going to impact in 10, 15, 20, 30 years in the future from when you you did something. So they would be things that would they would unquestionably be the worst disasters in human history if they happened. They would not we don't think, you know, destroy civilization, although civilizations, you know, maybe maybe not always as robust as we think it could be, but it certainly would be the biggest disaster humankind had ever seen. So it would be able to be the sort of thing we would use to try to prevent those from happening. How does it feel knowing that this has gotten us a little closer to maybe being able to do that? Honestly, it's very gratifying, you know, in, in talking in, to people over the years about this. It's been the sort of thing where people... A lot of people would say, oh, man, you know, I stay up at late worrying about are we going to get by an asteroid tomorrow? Are we going to get hit by an asteroid, you know, in, in a month or in a year? There's all these clickbait articles out there. And so I, I feel like if if people can sleep a little better, you know, OK, maybe we can't help them with, you know, the, the weird noise they hear with the house creaking at night or, what, you know, that sort of thing. But at least they don't have to th say Oh my God! What if an asteroid's going to hit? Well, we we can't do anything about it. So that that feels, I feel good about that. <laughs> I'm kind of wondering what people used to ask you. You know, when you, they asked you what you do at a cocktail party, what you would tell them, and how they might take it differently now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sitting on an airplane is is usually the one, right? And it's if if you feel like talking to the person next to you, then you say, oh, I, I work on planetary defense. And if you don't feel like talking to the person next to you, you say, well, you know, I study the small bodies of the solar system, the building blocks of terrestrial planet formation. But this is, it's a very easy concept to understand. It doesn't take a whole lot of, of effort to convince people that this is something that is certainly worth looking at, worth exploring. And it, it does resonate. You know, we had a, a huge audience of of the public kind of riding along with us in late September with the the live broadcast and it, it clearly struck a note that I think even some some folks involved in the mission were surprised just how well it resonated I guess you make this also real for people right like I'm an astronomer people think oh I look at the I look at the sky at night kind of thing and that is not at all what's going on here this is this the kind of science you hoped to do 
Yeah, uh, I'll I'll just back up slightly. Yeah, I agree. Most people think, uh, I think, that an astronomer, you know, we we are constantly on a night schedule. We're constantly on the night shift. You know, we're sitting in a dome, you know, kind of looking through an eyepiece and stuff. And of course, that's that's not what it's like anymore. Um, I've I've always been interested in asteroids. Uh, I've had plenty of nights at the telescope uh, looking at asteroids. You know, the science I've done has been more of the the thing you tell people when you don't want to talk to them on the airplane, honestly. Uh, you know, figuring out the compositions of materials early in solar system history. And asteroids are really interesting because they pull together a whole lot of different things. You know, they're this, these leftover bits from what the planets are made of. They are also potential threats to the Earth. But they're also uh, the source of some amazing opportunities. People have talked about trying to mine them, try to, you know, that that if if the Earth's economy ever does for real go into space, which you can argue about whether or not that would be a good thing, but uh, that mining of asteroids and, and economic use of asteroids is probably going to be the, the way it first gets out there. So they're just great, great targets for study. Andy Rifkin, thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. This has been great. Public Health On Call is a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health, produced by Joshua Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by J.B. Arbogast, Holly Cardinal, Philip Porter, Spencer Greer, and Matthew Martin, with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo. Social media run by Grace Fernandez and Shian Briscoe. If you have questions or ideas for us, please send an email to publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Thank you for listening. <laughs>